Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, members of our economic team, and all of you are here from the Office of Management and Budget, the Council of Economic Advisors, Treasury, and the National Economic Council. Welcome. It is an honor to be with you here today. There are few groups in this administration that deserve more praise than the staff members who do the hard work of developing the President's budget and economic strategy. Simply put, you are amongst the brightest, most talented, and hardest working individuals I know. Whether it has been forecasting out your economic conditions or developing initiatives and policies, tracking federal receipts and collections, or analyzing budget options, allocating funds, or maintaining fiscal discipline, you have been at the heart of the process that has helped build the strongest American economy in a generation. Every day it is your dedication, your hard work, and often your sacrifice that help make the President's vision and agenda a reality. I know this, the members of the President's economic team know this, and the President and Vice President know this, and we are all extremely grateful. You are the first economic staff in three decades to have the good fortune and is what, what has turned out to be the great challenge of working with a budget surplus. We realize this has not made your jobs any easier. Since starting work on the FY99 budget last fall and winter, you have been caught in an almost continuous cycle of work that hasn't broken in speed or urgency. Your stamina and unflagging focus have helped carry us through this spring's budget, the summer's emergency declarations, the fall's appropriation negotiations, and now, once again, into the thick of the budget process for fiscal year 2000. While others might have found this pace discouraging, it seems to have made you more efficient and more impressive. Personally, I think this can be attributed to your remarkable ability to look at facts and figures in really creative and innovative ways. Just think about the statistics the people in this room have produced during the last three months, statistics that may never find their way into a budget or an economic report. Instead of focusing on the nearly 36,000 cumulative overtime hours you've spent in your office, you can stress the increased productivity they've brought. Instead of dwelling on the 4,900 home-cooked meals you've missed, <laughs> you can point to the 12,600 morning, afternoon, and late-night runs to Starbucks and McDonald's. Forget about the 375 holiday parties you miss while preparing the budget. Treasure the stronger friendships and professional camaraderie you've built <laughs> while working together on Christmas and New Year's Day. But two facts about your work are certain. First, year in and year out, you are consistently working to produce the best possible economic plan for the American people. And second, you are working for a president and vice president who are making every day count in solving problems for average people and making life better for all Americans. It's now my honor to introduce to you a man who has been central to the President's economic team since day one, a man who's been at the President's side, leading efforts to reinvent government, strengthen our economy, and prepare our nation for the 21st century. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President of the United States, Al Gore. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John, and thank you for your leadership. I wish you hadn't taken all of my OMB work jokes. <laughs> but it's great to be here, and I'd, I'd like to begin by expressing thanks to our outstanding economic team, Treasury Secretary Bob Rubin, Budget Director Jack Liu, the Chair of our Council of Economic Advisors, Janet Yellen, Director of the National Economic Council, Gene Sperling, Deputy uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Larry Summers. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Sylvia Matthews, a Deputy at OMB, and Sally Katzen, Deputy at NEC. And above all, following on John Podesta's comments, I want to thank the entire staff of the Office of Management and Budget. It, it really would take a lot of work to calculate all of the the, the hard work and sacrifice, much less the insight and the experience that the group of men and women in this room and others who have worked with you have poured into our budgets during these past six years. 
But I think everybody understands that we are a stronger nation because of your hard work and dedication, and we're extremely grateful to you. Let's not forget what we inherited six years ago. It's easy sometimes, as we struggle with the uh, higher class problems of what to do with a surplus, to forget the problems that were bedeviling this nation six years ago when we had a deficit of $290 billion, the highest annual deficit in the history of the United States. Government borrowing was so out of control that businesses throughout this nation and even foreign nations were pleading with us to stop blocking economic growth. It was routine for President Clinton's predecessors to go to international meetings and hear stern lectures about why the United States economic policy was so out of control and creating such problems in the rest of the world economy, and to go to business meetings and hear the same lecture from uh, our, our business leaders here in the United States of America. And no wonder. The deficit was not only $290 billion that year, it was projected to go on up to more than $400 billion by this year. And there was no consensus, no plan, no way to get the problem under control. America was trapped between two false and unappealing choices, tax and spend on the one hand, cut and run on the other hand. Well, President Clinton knew that both of those options were wrong. And with your help and supported by your hard work, President Clinton and I charted a new economic course for America, emphasizing strict fiscal discipline, open markets, and targeted investments in America's future. I'm especially uh, proud of the work that we've done through our Reinventing Government initiative to cut government down to its smallest size since President Kennedy's administration and simultaneously make it work better, and in the process to start to redeem the very promise of self-government. In 1993, when we passed that plan that President Clinton wrote that eliminated most of our budget deficit, there were uh, famous predictions loudly made that the plan would destroy jobs. Well, we now know that by balancing the budget and lowering interest rates, that plan has helped to fuel unprecedented private sector growth and more than 17 million new jobs. In 1997, when we passed a balanced budget, some said we could never eliminate the deficit and cut taxes for the middle class and invest in the future all at the same time. Well, today, we see surpluses as far as you can look over the horizon. And we've cut taxes for families, and we're making the 21st century investments that are going to fuel even stronger economic growth. Investments like 100,000 new teachers in the classroom to reduce classroom size. Investments like the next generation internet and many others. And now, at the beginning of this year of 1999, President Clinton is unveiling a new agenda for the 21st century to help families care for aging loved ones, to strengthen our military, to crack down on crime and drugs, to protect the environment, even as we reserve every penny of the surplus until we save Social Security first. Well, we've come a long way from the runaway deficits and false choices of six years ago. And make no mistake, there is one man at the heart of all our economic progress in this nation. I'm going to present him in just a moment. He is the person who has laid the foundation for the greatest job-creating engine our nation has ever known. One person who has made fiscal discipline and lean, effective government a first principle and not just a bumper sticker. One man who has made America's economic strategy the model for the entire world and is giving us new faith in our ability to solve problems together. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to present to you my friend, one of the greatest economic stewards in the history of the United States of America, our President, Bill Clinton. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning. Uh, let me begin by saying that uh, 
for me, a primary purpose of this event is not only to uh, formalize uh, our uh, budget projections for this coming year, but just to thank all of you. Uh, I guess I ought to begin with uh, John Podesta and the Vice President. I never dreamed when I asked John Podesta to be Chief of Staff that he would become the stand-up comic of the administration. <laughs> sort of seemed out of character, but I thought it was pretty good, and I could see a lot of you were reliving your uh, holiday excruciating experiences. Uh, one of the hardest jobs of the Vice President, he has to do all these very burdensome representations of the administration. He has to go places that I can't go or don't want to go, and shoulder <laughs> burdens I can't bear. and. And he just really, uh, he, he went above and beyond the call by representing the administration at the Tennessee-Florida State football game. And I want to thank him <laughs> for that enormous sacrifice. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the members of the economic team who've already been mentioned. Uh, we have had a, an extraordinary relationship uh, over the last uh, six years. Uh, it began before I assumed office with endless discussions and arguments about the finer points of what would be in the economic plan of 1993. Uh, it continued uh, yesterday with a two-hour meeting about what is the appropriate thing to do uh, with the crisis uh, that the American steel industry faces now. Uh, and in every meeting, we uh, have what I consider to be uh, uh, examples of genuine patriotism because the people around the table are always working for what is in the best interest of the American people over the long run. And I want to thank all of you because without you, none of these arguments would amount to anything because you have to put uh, flesh on the bones of the policies that we adopt. And I thank you for that. Uh, let me say that the the preparation of a national budget, I think, sometimes does get lost in, in the agony of the numbers crunching or the cleverness of finding one final way to solve one last problem. But we should never forget that there are human stories behind all these numbers. Uh, because of the work that you have done, we literally have opened the doors of college education to all Americans. And you should never forget that because of the work that you have done in the balanced budget, we were able to provide uh, the opportunity for another five million children to have health insurance, uh, to figure out a way to, to uh, make that big down payment on the uh, 100,000 teachers. And for those who are skeptical, I would remind you that uh, we are now going to finish this year our commitment of 1993 to 100,000 police officers uh, ahead of schedule and under budget, giving the United States the lowest crime rate in 25 years. So I thank you for all of that. Uh, you heard the Vice President say that, uh, that uh, when we uh, took office, well, actually, uh, shortly before we took office at Blair House, I got the final estimate of the budget deficit for the first year of my presidency, $290 billion. And I was told that uh, by this year, if I survived this long, and back in 93, I wondered when I looked at those deficit numbers, that it would be over $400 billion. Uh, we then had some very difficult decisions to make because we wanted to reduce the deficit and balance the budget. We wanted to bring interest rates down. We thought there was no way to get the American economy going again without doing so. But we knew that we had to invest in the future of America. And we also knew that we were in the middle of a 20-year decline in the real earnings of average middle class citizens and we wanted to give particularly lower income working people with children a tax cut even in 1993, which we did by doubling the earned income tax credit. So we had to put that very tough budget together. The key was doing enough, figuring out enough to get interest rates down because high interest rates were keeping entrepreneurs from starting new businesses or expanding them. They were discouraging young people from buying homes. They were uh, as has already been said, causing grave questions about the leadership of the United States and the rest of the world. Uh, our deficit had become a symbol of the inability of government to play its essential role in American life. So 
we put together our strategy based on fiscal discipline, investing in our people, and expanding American sales of products and services abroad. Uh, the results have been clear. There were a lot of dire predictions uh, from the naysayers, and the budget passed by the narrowest of margins. But it began the process which led to the 1997 balanced budget, led to the second balanced budget we passed last year, and has now given us over 17 million new jobs and the lowest unemployment rate in 28 years, the lowest percentage of our people on the welfare rolls in 29 years, and the highest home ownership in history. All of you can be justly proud of the role you played in that. Now, just uh, three months ago, we were able to announce for the first time in three decades a budget surplus. The surplus I announced that day, $70 billion, was the largest in American history as a share of our economy, the largest since the 1950s. Today, I am proud to announce that I, we can say the era of big deficits is over. We are now entering the second year of an era of surpluses. Our economists project that in 1999, we will close out this century with a surplus of not less than $76 billion, the largest in the history of the United States. And I thank you for your role in that. Now, the chart over here, Gene Sperling never wants me to get up here without charts, so here I am. The chart over here shows you the difference, starting in 1999, of the projections for this year as compared with the reality. And the gap is all the money the American people have saved, the money that has gone back into the economy, the money that has made it possible for interest rates to be lower and investment to be higher. Just as exploding deficits were the symbol of a government failing its people in the 1980s, these surpluses are a symbol of a government that works in the 1990s and beyond. One that lives within its means, that cuts wasteful spending, that still honors the values and the priorities of the American people. Education, health care, the environment. It is the smallest government in 35 years by well over 300,000 fewer people than when we took office but more prepared than ever to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Deficit reduction has brought tangible benefits to millions of families. We saved the American people more than a trillion dollars on the national debt. More than seven million new families have realized their dream of owning a home. Another 18 million families have refinanced their homes at lower mortgage rates, and I'd bet anything that includes some people in this room. For millions of Americans, the lowest, these low interest rates have amounted uh, to a tax cut of tens of billions of dollars, putting in reach a family vacation, a new car, perhaps a college education. So today, I wish we could say our job is done in the midst of this celebration. In a time like this, it would be easy just to do that, to call a halt to this meeting and to say, uh, go back to work and just figure out how to keep these numbers in line. But the truth is, all of you know, we still have very large challenges as a country, challenges that this surplus gives us the opportunity to meet. We worked hard to bring fiscal discipline to produce this surplus, like any family with long-term financial needs and a little more earnings than we expected. We can't go out and spend the surplus today. We have to plan for the future. That is why I have said repeatedly, before we even consider new spending or tax cuts, first we must set this surplus aside until we save Social Security for the 21st century. We know that in about 30 years, the Social Security Trust Fund will no longer be able to meet the retirement needs of our generation, mine, the baby boomers. No parent wants his retirement to be funded by his children. No parent in the baby boom generation wants our children to have to spend less on our grandchildren's education and upbringing because we failed to fix Social Security at this time. So, therefore, I have said and I will reiterate today, uh, while there, there are many needs out there in this country, 
there are still investment needs in education, investment needs in research, investment needs in the environment, investment needs in other health care initiatives. While there are many arguments that can be made to give families further tax relief, particularly those coping with the burdens of raising their children and the cost of child care while going to work, first we must save Social Security for the 21st century before we consider new spending or other tax cuts. Some say that this task will be too complicated uh, for the Congress and the administration to achieve, that uh, the will is too weak, that the political system too divided. I do not agree with that. I heard that six years ago when I showed up here. The uh, political system was weak and the parties were divided. And look at all that's happened in the last six years by sustained good faith effort not just with the budget, but in the area of education, in the area of crime control, in the area of the environment, in the area of health care, in the area of promoting world peace, in the area of biomedical research, and so many other things. Uh, we cannot use anything as an excuse not to deal with our most pressing priorities. I do not intend to do it. I do not think the American people expect us to do it. And I think that we will surprise the skeptics by dealing with the Social Security challenge over the next several months. You have given us the tools to do it with this surplus. And when that happens, you can also take a full measure of pride in that achievement. Now, let me also say to you that there are a lot of other challenges, as I have said. We have to deal with the Medicare challenge. It's the same thing as the Social Security challenge, except it will hit us sooner. We have to pass the Patient's Bill of Rights. We have to continue to fund our education uh, commitments. But we can do all these things. But believe me, at every single turn in the road, we'll have to figure out how to make the numbers add up, how to stay within our commitment to fiscal discipline, how to be as, as clever as we can in the use of our resources without going over the line and being so clever we endanger the fiscal responsibility, the low interest rates, the economic success that has brought us to this point. We have to depend on you to keep that balance, to have that creative tension. I know you will do it. I hope you will think about this chart when you go home tonight. I hope that you'll be proud of what you have done for your country. And I hope you will know that we are very proud of you and very grateful. Thank you very much and Happy New Year.